Episode 296, The Great Dying. This is The Change Underground. I'm your host, John Moore. Decarbonise the air, recarbonise the soil. Turns out an article I stumbled upon last week is based on a three-year-old paper from the 2019 March edition of Hortenary Science Reviews entitled Earth System Impact of the European Arrival and the Great Dying in the Americas after 1492. There's a link in the show notes to the original paper. And from the conclusion of that journal article, quote, We conclude that the great dying of indigenous peoples of the Americas led to the abandonment of enough cleared land in the Americas that the resulting terrestrial carbon uptake had a detectable impact on both atmospheric CO2 and global surface air temperatures in the two centuries prior to the Industrial Revolution. End quote. The Great Dying refers to the loss of life in the Americas following European discovery of the Americas' existence. The authors reckon on a death toll of about 55 million people. That's not to say 55 million individuals were shot, put to the sword or worked to death in mines and on plantations, though many were. The greatest loss of life appears to have been caused by the well-developed and extensive trading networks spread across both continents and Central America. As we are well aware, after the last two and a half years, a novel infection can be deadly. Even a cursory look at the early spread of our current pandemic shows it flowing from the source to an area involved in trade with the People's Republic. Milan, a city involved in the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative, was one of the first Italian cities to be overwhelmed. Given our interconnected world and its dependence upon Chinese manufactured goods, the spread was going to be, and indeed was, almost universal. As we all know by now, disease travels from person to person. In the pre-industrial world of post-Columbus-Columbian contact, this person-to-person spread was along and across trading networks, which also collapsed. According to the article, 90% of the population perished. This is a mind-bogglingly large percentage to get our heads around. And this had consequences beyond the political. As the article points out, the reforestation of large areas of the planet had a climate impact as people were no longer farming. In fact, it had a 0.15 degrees Celsius drop in global mean temperatures, which had effects upon all of the globe. Now, we look certain to blow past a tenfold larger increase in global mean temperatures, and those effects are with us now. The worrying thing I took out of this article was the delay. Within a short time, a generation at most, the population dropped by 90%. Agricultural land reforested and sucked CO2 out of the atmosphere. But the effects of this were fully, weren't fully felt until the end of the second century after it had happened. Now, I may be drawing a long bow on this, but it would suggest to me that no matter what we do to reduce greenhouse gas levels in the atmosphere now, and there is much we must do, the effects won't be felt for generations. We need to start taking mitigate, mitigation actions now. From an Australian point of view, that means a couple of things. After the past two years of La Nina weather events, and a possible third one coming, we need to move towns, villages and probably cities above floodplains. If you stand by a river and look at right angles to the bank, you will see the floodplain the flat bit beside the river. But if you look further, you'll see a rise and then another flat area. This is known as the secondary floodplain, what used to be called the one in a hundred years floodplain, the first being the primary floodplain. Sometimes you'll see a third or tertiary plain as well. We need to move habitation, permanent settlements, above these levels. Cities like Lismore in northern New South Wales have been flood prone since they were settled. During 2022, it's been flooded to near record levels twice in a month. And we know in this wide brown land, the next drought is already on its way. If a drought means anything nowadays, it means bushfires. The fuel levels will be enormous after the last couple of years' rains. The drought will turn this to tinder and we'll be off into another bushfire season. 
For those that are interested, there's a photo in the transcript over at the website showing the height of the levee, the flood in 74, which was the last really big one, and this year's floods on the side of a building. The levee's just basically a waste of resources. Now, all these things are not just pertinent to Australia. Australia, though, has long been suggested as the canary in the coal mine. No pun intended, but I'll take it when it comes to, cli- when it comes to climate change. That being said, we have several challenges. One, move populations away from flooding risks, including rising sea levels. Two, build earth-covered houses for fire safety and inbuilt insulation. Three, use floodplains for food production with systems to rapidly move livestock to higher ground. Stop adding greenhouse gases to the atmosphere. Five, electrify everything and power it with green energy. And six, shorten as many supply lines as possible. Point one, I think, is unavoidable. The floods will keep coming and getting worse based upon current evidence. Point two, I can see it is a little extreme. I've just got a fascination for earth-covered houses. But so too were the wildfires of 2019-2020 here in Australia and across Siberia. At the very least, earth-covered structures should be mandated in peri-urban areas. That forest habitation interface is most dangerous. Yet fires still made it into townships and destroyed them too. So a larger, no-flammable buffer area and different building codes adjacent to those areas will be a necessity. Using floodplains for food production rather than housing seems a no-brainer to me. So much excellent market garden soil around Sydney in my lifetime has been converted to housing and the food basket moved west of the Great Dividing Range. Changing the zoning to protect the growing areas from the property developers would put a stop to this. The standard IPCC calls for an end to greenhouse gas production is, to my mind, nothing all that radical. This is especially so now that the effects of climate change are as obvious, are obvious as per the latest IPCC report. This necessitates the, the electrification of everything. The quiet this would bring to the world would be worth the investment alone. And of course, shortening of supply lines in a place is a place where we can all start from home veggie garden production to chooks, ducks and rabbits. We can replace much of the road transport adding to greenhouse gases that comes from food. When we add in bananas from Peru and beans from Kenya and cut flowers from Ecuador as part of the supply chains for Europe and North America, shortening those will have a positive effect upon CO2 levels as well. The people growing those products will need support to grow different crops or even work in different industries as their long-distance markets dry up. In the same way a country at war will realign its economy to a war footing, we need to transform the global economy to a climate change mitigation and reversal footing. Victory gardens, land armies and so on will be needed as the effects of climate change and the pandemic continue to impact supply lines. I'm not advocating for a fortress mentality where each country locks itself up, but more of a pancake mentality. Closing borders and hoarding foods and energy resources ultimately hurts everyone. But having localised food production spread wide and thin, like a pancake, rather than like a pyramid, and based upon a zero-waste approach, will see the nutrients return to the soil rather than the current situation. At present, chemical inputs are poured onto soil, waterways are polluted, Food is trucked to distribution warehouses and then into supermarkets. From there it heads into homes, is consumed and the waste products disappear through the sewerage system and more often than not out to sea or into waterways. We're basically moving topsoil through this system from the land to the ocean and degrading both. So start where you are and begin with what you have. Plant, plant and then plant some more. If you're not yet growing and would like some guidance, the discount is still on over for the No Dig Garden course over at the World Organic News. You'll learn to have a garden up in an hour. It's currently selling for $17, not the usual $149, until the world starts to return to a little more normality. So if you've been put off in the past, now's the time to jump in and learn. If you know anyone who would be interested, and the more people we can get growing, the better, please let them know. 
I'll have a link in the show notes or you can go to worldorganicnews.com and click on the course tab. Please spread the word. We need to get as much food happening as possible, as close to the people eating it as we can. The best time to move from consumption to production was probably 50 years ago. And the second best time is now. Decarbonise the air. Recarbonise the soil. Thank you all for listening. I'll be back next week.